Hello, everyone, and welcome back for another episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. This is your host, Howard Fox. The Outdoor Adventure Series celebrates individuals and families, businesses, and organizations that seek out and promote the exploration, stewardship, and enjoyment of the great outdoors. Our guest today is Mitch Miller. Mitch is an award-winning landscape photographer and founder of Fine Earth Photography. He is known for capturing the beauty of rugged landscapes, deserts, and alpine environments. Mitch, it's a pleasure to have you on the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. Thank you for joining us. It's good to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Howard. Fantastic. And for our listeners, I don't know, we may or may not put this video up on YouTube. Well, Mitch and I will have to agree on that, but he has a wonderful black and white picture behind him. And I had my Outdoor Adventure Series background. And I thought I'm getting envious, so I had to switch my background a little bit. But that's a wonderful picture behind you there. Tell us a little bit about that. A year ago, January, there was a snowstorm predicted in Joshua Tree National Park. And we live about 25 minute drive north of the park. And we could look through the window in the dark and see it was even darker than usual because of the clouds. And snow was forecast. So my wife and I drove into the park. We got there before first, first line. And we watched it go from snow to sleet to rain. And by the time it was light, we had the place to ourselves for an hour and a half, the area that we've seen in the photo, because other people could not get up the road for the ice on the way. Oh, wow. And I call this photo still, I'm sorry, silent, and it's color sisters called still. And it's slightly different by focal lines, but I love it. I'm glad you like it. Yeah, fantastic. I. You're, have you been in California all your life? And we're going to get into a little bit of background of, of where you were from. And I believe it was the, on the, on the, uh, East coast, but i i I'm sure you're familiar with snow. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. I lived in North Carolina for 11 years. I saw snow. Okay. <laughs> there, there, and the reason I'm asking about this is growing up in the Midwest, my most cherished memories of snow were at night right after it stopped snowing or even as it was snowing because it was quiet mm -hmm. and there was just something about being around the snow and the quiet and there was nothing there was no other sounds around or that mm -hmm. you could yeah. hear it means the sound yeah and that's what the the photo reminds me of is just the quiet and there's just something about it. So again, fantastic shot. And so let's kind of circle back if we could share a little bit about your background and eventually we'll get into this, this wonderful work that you're doing as a uh, land, uh, landscape photographer and just love, you know, well, let's start from the beginning. I think it began with my parents. My mother was an artist. She was born in Rockford, Illinois, and she was a painter and a writer. And uh, my father was an engineer from New York State, and he was a hiker, a backpacker. And then uh, the two of them together, and my brother would take me camping in Yosemite National Park, and we would go up to the Tuolumne Meadows and camp near the Tuolumne River. And I, I was so excited in 2012 camping there with my brother and my nephews, right across from where my mom um, taught me what water was, waterfalls were. <laughs> <laughs> what not to do. And it was just delightful, the hiking. And we would go camping in Portola State Park up uh, on San Francisco Peninsula. And my dad hated the desert. He thought it was just a bunch of brown hills. <laughs> because I guess I'm spite. I moved to the desert. <laughs> there you <laughs> go. Joking. I grew up in the in the Midwest in, in the Detroit suburbs. And in the, in the other half of my life, I was in Chicago before moving to Las Vegas. And I never really had the opportunity to go camping that the camping that I know of today, where you kind of have a backpack and you go off for a day or two. Mm -hmm. And I love the fact what you just shared, you went with your family and you, yeah. and because my family never did these kinds of trips we did the weekend getaways up to Mackinac Island and you know detoured the day trips of Tequamenon Falls up in the UP but 
to go camping in these beautiful national parks. We never did that. And the fact that you did it with your family, that's, that had to have been a fantastic experience, even more than what you just described. It was. And if you get away from it for a while in your life, for whatever reason, like college, it's easier to get back into it when you've got special memories about it from your youth. My, my folks will also take me to arboretums, the LA Arboretum, Descanso Gardens. They love to go to finely landscaped grounds. And I got into it. Okay. Fell in love with flowers. I, I, I love that. And we could talk about flowers because that's one of my favorite parts about like even going out to the desert recently, seeing the flowering Joshua trees and the, what's the other cactus that was the flower? The yucca. The yucca. yucca. Yeah. And just like, wow, I never knew there were flowers and there they were. And I was just taking photos of them and thinking, that's just fantastic. Uh, and the, the flowers are the size of a football or larger. Mm -hmm. Creamy yellow flowers and purple slash red flowers. Delightful. <laughs> so I have to ask this question then. The flowers, and I never did it. I, I, I guess I could have, but I didn't. Do did these flowers give off a smell? I've not noticed them on the Mojave Yucca. Maybe if, if at all, it's very, very faint. Okay. When you were younger and your parents would take you to, you know, did the camping, you went to the, the, the arboretums, these, these uh, manicured grounds. When did this bug of photography start to take shape for you? That like something, I really want to do more of this. We moved to North Carolina from uh, the San Jose area when I was 15. And it was kind of a shock to be taken away from the Redwoods and the Sierra Nevada. And I remember climbing a fire lookout outside of uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, and looking out at this large, flat, green pancake of land. <laughs> so I need to go back home. I, I, I got to like North Carolina a lot more when I went to college in Chapel Hill because the fall colors were gorgeous there yeah. and the hills were rolling and beautiful. But it was in uh, when I was 16 and went back to California for a six week trip. I had a Polaroid big swinger, the kind that would spit out the photo and you'd watch it develop before your oh, eyes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I photographed everything I saw the Golden Gate Bridge, the 1915 uh, exposition, uh, somewhere in the Golden Gate Park. A Golden Gate Park and Southern California had rollups all over California. And I came home and I just had a ball looking at all those photos. They're all black and white. And I asked my stepmom, could I have a, a real camera? And uh, she, she wasn't the, the native mom, my natural born birth mom, who was the artist. And she said, well, possibly someday. And that someday was about 12 or 13 years later when I finally bought one. Okay. Okay. When you were going to, uh, to school, Chapel Hill, what did you study? I had a hard time deciding on what I wanted to be when I grew up. Uh, <laughs> I still have that problem. <laughs> I get to I talk first... for a living. That's what I love. <laughs> when I first arrived, I chose music. And I bombed at that. I wanted to be a rock and roll guitar player like Jimi Hendrix or Jimmy Page. Mm -hmm. And nobody goes to college to study that. And what they, what they taught me was classical guitar. And it just didn't take. It was okay, okay, but it didn't take. So I changed to radio, TV, motion pictures. No, I'm sorry, English. Because I thought I could be a writer. That didn't okay. take. Then radio, TV, motion pictures. Then I dropped out. Then I went back and got a degree in business. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm not seeing the real threads going on here, but I'm sure we're going to eventually <laughs> capture some, some threads. So how did you, this love of photography or this rediscovery of photography begin to take shape for you? When I came back to California in 1979, I worked in retail and uh, one day there was a, um, a company picnic and I was driving several of my employees to the picnic. We're driving north on 605 freeway. And it was the first clear day since I had moved there in the summertime. 
and I saw the San Gabriel Mountains, which is where I learned what snow was. I can't okay. it. And I had to pull over on the side of the road and I was just gaping at these mountains and all my employees in the car were laughing. <laughs> Here's Mr. Wheeler <laughs> looking at these mountains like a crazy man. And I said, what is that? Well, it's the San Gabriel Mountains. And I picked up a AAA hiking guide and it listed this hike to the summit of Mount Baldy that had 4,000 feet elevation gain. I didn't know what that meant. I learned <laughs> I know later it's coming, it meant, by the way. <laughs> I the one up uphill. So I took a friend, a former friend. <laughs> we, we hiked Mount Baldy. I've got a picture of her lying face down with her mouth in a creek and she's screaming, I hate you. I hate you. We got to the top. <laughs> We got to the top and these people sunning themselves in lawn chairs. They'd taken up the chairlift. Oh, like, chairlift, what chairlift? And there were gliders sailing above us and we loved it. The view was amazing. So the next mountain I climbed, which was St. Jacinto, the following year, my roommate lent me his 35 millimeter camera. So in May of 1981, I became a hiker slash photographer and haven't looked back since. That is fantastic. And, and in 79, 80, 81, we're still talking film. Yeah. I have about 30,000 slides sitting in boxes. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I, I paid my way through school as a wedding photographer and. Oh, wow. I, uh, yeah. That's what that's, ex, that's exactly it. It's like, wow, you really did that. And I shot uh, four. I shot four. That's it. You, you were a smart man. It's like something that I think I'll stick with the mountains and the trees, but, but I'm making up for lost time now. When you began to then, you, it sounds like you're, you're, you become a pretty accomplished hiker. Now, maybe it's not the extreme hike to Pacific Crest Trail or the, the John Muir Trail or the Appalachian Trail. Maybe you have done that. Have you done that? Or I've hiked sections of the John Muir Trail from okay. the northern terminus at Happy Isles in Yosemite. Okay. South to Whitney Portal. I mean, okay. no, the southern end is the summit of Mount Whitney, which I've been to nine times. Okay. Do you, would you call yourself uh, kind of an avid hiker? Like it's the that combination. I'm going to go hike. I'm going to take my camera with me. My, I imagine you'd take a tripod as well, or some maybe you don't, I don't know, but do you, is this part of the, the work that you're doing now is getting hiking to out to these places that the average person, I would probably be that average person wouldn't get to and just kind of shooting to your heart's content. Is that what your, what the work is now? I love going to remote places. I have, I have a photo that I love called untracked because I never saw another footprint there except for my friends. But I usually carry a tripod when I'm going in the Sierra, like I plan to at the end of June. Oh, for nine days, I'll have a light tripod, mostly because I plan on shooting the Milky Way. Uh -huh. And in some respects, it's more difficult than the John Muir Trail because there'll be times where there is no trail. In fact, this morning, I came upon a photo from uh, a hike I did in 2013 with a friend I'm going with in late June this year to the same place, but my wife and I were laughing just how steep it was. I don't know if that answered the question, but yes, tripod, rugged, remote, check all the boxes. <laughs> all right. Yeah. I mean, it's some people worry about packing too much, but you know, having that tripod with you and especially taking the time to do the Milky Way and there, there's something special about that. When did you begin to set your eyes on running this, this business and becoming, you're an entrepreneur, an artist, and you started fine earth photography. When did this idea become reality for you? I, I first sold a photograph in 1990. It was just some friends. It was a, a winter sunset, an Ocotillo silhouette against this bright red sunset in Ansberg at State Park. And the feeling of selling photography was fun. It felt really good. I think I got the name Fine Earth Photography possibly before I started the business. What happened there was 
in 2000, I was going out to photograph for a United Nations Environment Program competition, photo competition. And I thought I would uh, go up on St. Gabriel's and spend a night or two and photograph urban sprawl. So I went there and carried a tent and water and stashed it for a week. I came back a week later with a sleeping bag and food and while well, it was raining and the highway height started to snow. Oh boy. I hiked out of the top of the clouds where I could see my shadow now, found my tent in under the snow and spent two nights. And the photographs were stunning. Icicles with city lights below in the distance. And a year later, I wanted to enter the Los Angeles County Fair photo contest. And so I entered some of the photos from that trip in 2000. And I entered them in the fine art photography category. Well, I had a backpacking trip. And while I was gone, my wife got phone calls saying, you need to come pick these up. He entered them in the wrong category. You should be in travel. <laughs> Apparently the Los Angeles County Fair had not taken the graphics arts class that I took that taught me that what I had delivered them was fine art. Oh, boy. And so I thought, well, if it's not fine art photography, it's fine art photography. So there, <laughs> that's okay. when I came up with it. Very good. Now, speaking of your wife, does she join you on these adventures? Less so now than she used to, but. We've had some amazing times together. Last year, we did a 43 day road trip to 23 states and 20 national parks. Oh boy. And I saw a little more hiking mileage, but we both saw some amazing sites. That know, is Michigan, Wisconsin, North Dakota. It was great. That, that is amazing. And I, I have a coworker. She is a career coach like myself. And I don't know what her husband does, but they literally. Uh, got rid of everything, sa save the car and, and the essential luggage. And there they left Washington, the Seattle area, and they're just traveling around living from place living to place. Yeah. yeah. And she's still Wonderful. coaching. So she's still on the phone. There's an internet connection. I have to figure out how she's accomplishing that because I'm thinking that would be kind of fun. So do you consider yourself retired and you are just continuing to live the life as this, this fine earth photographer, this, or, or is there, is there a business side that is continuing for you? No, it's a business. There's a street fair in Palm Springs called Village Fest that I started okay. doing weekly in okay. December. And so I promote, I promote my work there. Sales are good. I'm making back what I pay for the space on the street and then some. Okay. But I'm also gaining some leads. Um, I, I offer free print giveaways, advance notice of sales. Occasionally I'll do a Zoom class on composition free for one hour. And a lot of people last night were really psyched to hear about that and are interested in that notice of new images. So yes, it's a business. It's okay. a second job. I okay. am retired from my other life too. <laughs> All right. The, the street fair life and, and. I, I've spent enough time on street it's street fairs back in Chicago and there's the one booth right after the other. And there's only so many photos of the Buckingham fountain lit up at night mm -hmm. or Sears tower. I have no idea what the other name for it is and I don't care what it is, but <laughs> there's only so many of those you can look at when you are at the, the 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 fair in Palm Springs, and that's got to be fun. Just Palm Springs, sitting at the booth on the on the director's chair, having people come in and look at your work. What what's what what do you learn or are or are getting from that experience of people coming in and just like discovering your work for the first time? I I am surprised at how much fun I'm having. The, the, the word I hear the most is wow. And I'll never get tired of that. Yeah. I I've learned to divide, um, the work into three categories. I've got Joshua trees. People are interested in the icon, right? I've, I love pinion pine and I can't sell pinion pines because these people, a lot of them are from the North country of snowbirds and, oh, we see pine trees. We see snow. We want the Joshua tree and the killer sunset. 
I also have the Milky Way photos together and the super bloom. But okay. three that really attract people's eyes, are, I call them a part of my time collection. And what I do is I will select the colors of what's living in an image and paste those to a Photoshop layer, turn the whole image black and white and paste the color back on top, creating a contrast in time. So that what's inanimate, deceased or dormant is black and white and what's living is in color and they love it. Oh, wow. I, I think this is the appropriate time for me being the opportunistic podcaster is we oftentimes, especially with the outdoor adventure series, love to put some photos up on our main webpage so that our, our listeners, when they visit it, can see some of the work that we're talking about. So if you're up for providing an example or two, perhaps even this, this, this uh, time, piece from this time collection, I would love to be able to share that with our listeners. If you're up for I'll it. Send it to you. Be happy yeah. to. Fantastic. Is, is there, perhaps you've mentioned this already, the one photograph to just continues day after day, year after year, takes your breath away. And like, this is why I do what I do. Is this the favorite photograph question? <laughs> this could be the favorite photograph question for our listeners. I always ask our guests, what questions would you like me to ask? And so, yes, that's the favorite photograph question. The favorite photograph question is about the answer. It's really about a new one, okay. not year after year. Oh, wow. I, I had an idea when the Joshua trees started blooming in February of this year Yeah, to uh, take advantage of the timing. Okay. Because they turn to these not very pretty green pods in about four to six weeks, I estimate. And in that short time, the galactic center of the Milky Way had reappeared above the horizon in the Northern hemisphere for the first time since about October. So in early March, I went backpacking by myself. This is another part of the time collection where I will show two moments at one scene on one night. What I needed was a Joshua tree flower at eye level, and most of them are 12 to 15 feet off the ground. So I walked with my backpack for about two hours and I found this big, fat, plump, beautiful Joshua tree flower at eye level. And I set up my tripod. It was also a requirement to have a clear view to the southeast where the okay. galactic center would appear about three in the morning. All right. Set up the tripod all night long, set up my tent, and I shot the flower at sunset in the wind. So, but you know, when it's sunny, you could use a fun shutter speed and not take the eye of solo too high. Right. Went to bed, got up at about 2.30 and started shooting the galactic center behind the flower. Well, the flower is whipping in the wind. Right. Well, so when I put the night version on the bottom in Photoshop and the day on top and align them as best as I could, I still had these artifacts, which was a night version of the leaves of the Joshua tree. And it's growing on me. It gives this kind of a 3D effect. But the title for this new, this new problem child is the dark side of the balloon. And I love it. It's so pretty. It's such a true tree. That is fantastic. Now, when will that uh, photo be ready for public viewing? I'll probably need psychiatric treatment before I'm ready because <laughs> it's, it's driving me crazy. I, I'm kind of becoming a perfectionist doing this. Yeah. But uh, I'm hoping what's in the next two to four weeks. Okay. Okay. I, I have some people who definitely want to meet you because when we go, I am not a three in the morning kind of guy. Uh -huh. I will stay up late, but I'm not the kind of guy who's going to get up at three o'clock in the morning to do the Milky Way, the, the galactic core. But I do know friends that are, and I, I may, I may just kind of sick them on. Let, let's talk about perfection. And it, there's a lot of folks in a variety of different industries and skills and whatever they do to make a living or keep that keeps them happy. They chase perfection and there's a body of literature. that says there's no such thing as perfection. And, and I'm not here to debate one side or the other, but 
when you say I'm a bit of a perfectionist, has it always been that way? Are you discovering that desire to achieve perfection because you're starting to get or continuing to grow and get better at what you're doing as a, as a photographer? How does that perfection live with you today? Well, I, I want to uh, come across as professional and I, I want people to see my images either as I remember them. And this is, this is the fun part, or as I want to remember them because people all often come in and say, do you Photoshop that a friend of mine who teaches workshops, his best answer is of course, <laughs> because the camera didn't know what I was thinking at the time. And so I use that and, uh, perfection. Mm. Okay. I, the best example I have of perfectionism is an image that took second place in photography at the Joshua Tree National Park Council of the Arts Expo, mm -hmm. which is a mouthful in <laughs> 2020. And it's called, I don't think I already said color fuel. The rain is the fuel that gives the plants the color right. or maintains it. I was out chasing thunder one day. I would, I would go in the direction I would see thunder. Of course, the rain had already come and gone, but it was coming again. I saw this beautiful monsoon cloud coming towards me. And I looked and here's all these beautiful curling juniper, old juniper, pinion, pine, living and dead. And I took seven photos. Okay. This is with a uh, handheld, different shutter, different shutter speeds, same aperture. So the depth of field doesn't change for high dynamic range. You've got a, a long exposure for the shadows, a fast exposure for bright parts of the image and everything between this for the midtones. Well, I pieced those together. And then I started choosing the colors in Photoshop that I wanted to keep what's living. Turned everything black and white. Like I explained earlier, pasted all the colors back. But I realized I'd covered up lichen and I love lichen. This image had a little orange, a little red, a yellow to green lichen. So I started erasing on the black and white layer oh. to reveal the lichen underneath. So this took a week, this particular image, seeking perfection. But it won second place. <laughs> hey, and I think visitors that come into the booth or any booth for that matter, or even see the photos that not so much myself, because I, I mean, I, I use, a, 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 I call it a rotator, but it, I'm botching up the name, but I use that on my tripod when I do, when I shoot the, uh, the Milky way mm -hmm. tracker. Thank you. I should know that I've interviewed a couple of, uh, dark sky photographers, but I have a tracker. And I'm happy if I get one good image that I've kind of massaged a little bit in Photoshop and I'm a happy guy because I want people to say, Ooh, ah, fantastic photo. And I'm good to go. But I think the average person who's coming into that booth really doesn't appreciate the full range and you use the term dynamic range as you're constructing your photo, but they don't understand the range of effort that goes into composing and creating this work of art, they think it should only happen one shot and, mm -hmm. and you, and, and there you are, but they don't understand there's a whole process behind it that makes the shot what it is and that makes it special. That's often the case. I mean, and I can, I can find, I pick out the people that get it pretty quickly. And yeah. the ones that don't, I love telling them the story. I'll say the magic to this one is blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. When you're maybe just, it's a, it's a day you just want to kind of relax and maybe you're with your wife and you decide, let's get out of the house. Let's go, let's go to our special place. Maybe it's in Joshua tree and, and it is a special place, but where would you go? Where is that special place for you? That like, you just go back over and over again, or would like to go back cause you haven't been there, but it, rem it remains that special place. 
her favorite national parks are Yellowstone and Death Valley. And we always have a great time camping at Furnace Creek in Death Valley oh, yeah. National Park. We've had some wonderful Thanksgiving meals there. She's already told me where she, like her ash is scattered in Yellowstone. Okay. <laughs> it's a beautiful place. I won't give it away though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't give it away. I don't think we're supposed to do that, but you brought, you brought to mind something um, okay. that is kind of pertinent to this week. There's several anniversaries going on this week. Our 23rd anniversary is coming to Sunday. Happy anniversary. Our, thank you. Our first anniversary after moving here five years ago, tomorrow, we went to Sheep Pass Group Campground in Joshua Tree National Park where we got married. And we were having a picnic lunch, but it's reserved for overnight use only. And we're sitting there having a picnic lunch and a ranger walked up and said, do you folks have a reservation? No, we don't, but we got married here what, in, in 1999 on this date. And he said, Mazel tov, and smiled and walked away. <laughs> I love that. He was so very cool with the idea of celebrating our anniversary right there. I love it. I love it. And it's funny, you brought up Furnace Creek. And I originally, when I moved out to Las Vegas, explored car camping. And I have a tent and a mattress that connects to the car, the tent, the mattress goes in the car. And it's just so much stuff that I'm carrying with me that I, I'm tired of it. So if I look back, I probably never would have bought it. So I have a two person pop-up tent. I've got a decent air pad and I have the um, sleeping bag and Furnace Creek is on my mind because right above Furnace Creek, there's that, you, you, there's no reservation. You just have to get there first. Uh, Texas Springs? Yes, Texas Springs. And there's also facilities there, so I don't have to worry about facilities. I, I think, uh, uh, Mitch, I'm going to get behind in my prepping my podcast for production, but I think you've convinced me that's where I'm going tomorrow is Good to Texas Springs. Good for you. Do it before it gets too hot. Yeah, well, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. So listen, before we head out, We've, we've chatted a little bit about your background, just kind of the stories of how you came about to really dive into this world of photography and really the, this, the fine earth and the landscapes and really these, some of this, the ruggedness of what you're capturing. What is a kind of, a, what we would call it on our podcast, an insight to go where Maybe it's a per, it's a place, it's a book, it's a quote that really speaks to the work that you're doing and what you would want to share with our listeners. This goes back so far. My my roommate from the early '90s gave me a license plate plate frame that had this quote: um, "Oops, pay my dues to see the views," because I've hiked to the summits of about 300 mountains in California. And it's a lot of dues to pay, but it's always been worth it. That is fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. If our listeners would like to learn more about you and your work, where are the best places for them to go, Mitch? Well, my website is findearthphotography.com. My Instagram handle is at findearthphotography. And my Facebook page is Fine Earth Photography. That's going to be an easy one to remember. And for our <laughs> listeners, we're going to provide the back links to uh, Mitch's website and to his Facebook and Instagram pages. Mitch, I hope you enjoyed uh, your time with us on the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. I am I'm incredibly grateful that I get to interview individuals like you. And again, I'm an opportunistic guy. You and I are not that far away from each other. And so I hope you and I cross paths and I'm going to, I may watch and I may try to capture, but I just kind of be, being there and learning from you and just kind of hearing more of your stories. I think that'd be a great way to spend a, a day or an evening or a weekend just, and just seeing how someone like yourself creates these wonderful works of art. So that'd be fun. We'll meet in the middle of shoot some night sky. 
You got it. Love to do that. Thank you again for joining us on the podcast. Stay on the line. We're going to do a quick close and you and I can have a final chat. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. All right, folks, you know, what an episode and wait till you see Mitch's photos. And so do check out fine earth photography.com and also his Facebook pages, Facebook page, Instagram, fine earth photography, some wonderful images. So for those that follow me on Facebook or Instagram, I occasionally I share images, but you know, I am like my, my mouth is open, like, wow. And there's some, definitely some wow photos out here. And we're definitely looking forward to sharing a couple of those with you when we post this episode up on our website. So I hope you enjoyed our discussion today with Mitch, just a wonderful background and really how he has taken this, this interest and this love of photography and found his way back out to the West and really how he's taken advantage of just also enjoying hiking just to get out there where nobody else is treading. So it's just uh, him and nature and just coming back and creating some wonderful works of art. Now, if you enjoyed today's episode, do check us out on the Outdoor Adventure Series uh, website, OutdoorAdventureSeries.com. We're also on Facebook and on LinkedIn or on the Outdoor Adventure Series pages. And as far as the podcasting directories, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, Audible, heck, we're everywhere uh, on the podcast world. So we definitely want to hear from you what you thought of the, this episode. Like it, comment on it, share it with your friends. And we definitely want to hear that. That helps us continue to grow. And really, it lets us know that we're doing the right stuff and we can go out and find really some stellar outdoor adventure enthusiasts and artists like, like Mitch. So again, I hope you enjoyed today's episode and we will see you again soon on the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. Take care now.